Well, greetings, dear friends. It's good to have you with us once again on these Monday night sessions, the Monday night open forum. We invite each of you to just join with us in a scripture search. And as always, the purpose in searching the scripture is that it is the testimony of Jesus Christ. And given of God that we may turn our hearts to see him as the father good pleasure to reveal that son in the believer so we just invite you to join with us tonight and we appreciate you being with us these sessions are brought to you uh, through the Midwest Center for Truth here in the northwest part up in the Ozark Mountains of Arkansas and uh, these sessions are a ministry of CMI Bible Research Center which is here on the grounds and a production of CMI audio video network system being brought to you at this time through Ustream and YouTube on the internet so we're glad to have you wherever you may be uh, watching this session we invite you to join in with us through emails, phone calls, communicate. And uh, let us hear uh, whatever questions you may have or sharing that you may have, comments, what the Lord is opening of himself in your heart. And we trust that the Lord will bless you uh, in our in our sharing together here this evening. Primarily, our hearts are concerned tonight with what we would call the finished work of God. Now, unlike the natural mind, may suppose we're not talking about something that that God has done and, and we're not talking about what Christ has done with regard to the cross his death his burial his resurrection, those are certainly realities even as his ascension and glorification and the reality of him living in the believer in a way that most believers cannot even conceive but a way that the Father desires to reveal. But what we're talking about is the finished work itself not what is, but who is the finished, complete, perfect work of God. And we find that it is Christ. We find that it is Christ. Not, not to be relegated to what he did but to who he is. I find that the cross is in reality the place, the time, we look at it historically for a moment, the place, the time chosen of God that he would reveal on earth, in heaven, to principalities, to powers, that he would reveal who the Son is. And made that manifest on the cross. It's not so much that there Christ died 
though he did, but it is there he was revealed of God, manifested of the Father, to be the death of all mankind. From Adam on, the death, the judgment, the death, the judgment of the world, the casting out of the enemy of God. Now is the judgment of this world, now is the prince of this world cast out. Showing himself to be the end, the death of all that was before him, before the cross, I'm speaking. All that ever came before the cross was gathered up into the cross. Not simply in death, but in his death. And so the death, the burial, not simply a Christ being buried, certainly not just laid in a tomb, But the burial, the putting away, the laying away, the burial that Christ himself is to all that is not Christ himself. The very hidden wisdom of God was made manifest in the cross and no flesh saw it no flesh recognized it but God made it manifest once and for all and his resurrection is not just the incident of one being raised up out from among the dead though he was raised up out from among the dead the reality of it is he and he alone is the resurrection and the life a finished and complete work One to which I can add nothing and one from which I can take nothing. Not in any reality at all. Not in any reality. I cannot make it better. I cannot make it worse. I cannot make perfect what God hath already made perfect. And I can't make worse what no man, no power can touch I can't do it I cannot add to it so as to make it other than who Christ is himself I can either come to know that in the power of the Spirit of God, by the working of the Spirit of God, by the revealing of the Son, or the other side of that is I can remain ignorant of what God has done in that He has made manifest a finished work that the Son Himself by the cross is. 
I can either see the salvation of the Lord or I can remain ignorant of the salvation of the Lord. Now those are the two things that I can do or that I can be participating in. But I cannot change what God has done. I cannot add to it. I cannot take away from it. I can either receive him, receive him, or I can reject him in my soul. Those two things I can do. Reject him in the hundreds of ways that that can be done. Or I can receive him in the one single way that that must be done. And that's really what it comes to. Now I'm just going to read one verse to get us started and then I'll let Rabin come in on this. Hebrews 10. You need to spend some time here. Hebrews 10 verse 9. We'll just pick up here. Then said he, well, let me start at verse 6. In burnt offerings and sacrifice, in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book. Jesus has said, search the scriptures, they are they which testify of me. The volume of them. The whole of them. The body of them. In the volume of the book. If we really believe that, folks, I'll get this read in a moment, but if we really believe that, search the scripture, they are they which testify of me. In the volume of the book it is said, if we really believe, if we can hear his words, if we really believe that the scripture given of God by prophet, by type, by shadow. If we really believe that these are they which testify of me, if we believe Christ saying that, why? 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 Would I ever question any meaning of any scripture? In and of itself or as to its meaning. Rather than saying, Father, it is the testimony of thy Son in spirit, in truth. The only answer to the meaning of it, of this volume, of this word, of this type and shadow 
of this statement, of this teaching. The only answer to it, the only life to it is in the seeing of your son. For otherwise I am looking and searching in the darkness of my own understanding. Then said I, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Not to attempt to do it. Not to try to do it. To do thy will, O God. Above when he said sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and offerings for sin. Thou wouldest not, neither had pleasure in them which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first. Not he attempts to do so. One day he will do so. If I allow him, he will do it. If I agree with him, he will do it. I came to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first. That there's a purpose in that. That he may establish the second by the which will, by the doing of that will, the taking away of the first, the establishing of the second. By which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once. King James adds for all. Once gets it said. That is said again in Romans 6. Once in that he died unto sin. He died once and again and again. The emphasis is made. Once. And for all. So the question finally comes to you and I. Did he do what he came to do? Is he who the Father reveals him to be? Or not? Is the question or the problem rather that he actually did little more than all of the sacrifices and offerings before him did and was his attempt to establish what the scriptures declare the second to be 
Did he do that? Or was that as temporal as the rebuilding of the old temple had been? When he said, destroy this temple, I will raise it again in three days. Did he do that or were the Jews correct in laughing at him and calling him a blasphemer? Because it comes down to all of this. Is the salvation of the Lord full and complete or is it not? Is that the problem or is the problem for the believer now? Not those who have not accepted Christ in any way at all, but for the believer is the problem on that side, God's side, or is the problem that God did what he said he would do. He sent the son he said he would send and that son is exactly who the father says that he is and reveals him to be to the heart that will turn to know him. And the problem is that I am ignorant of it. And that's kind of what we're talking about, I guess. And we've been talking about it a lot here. I'm put rather in the place of Paul in Rome are in second in first Corinthians fifteen. Have we been preaching a truth that is in vain? We have been declaring this glorious, eternal, finished work of God in Christ to find that it is not so, that it is in vain, that our preaching is in vain, and that the salvation that we declare is not real and is in vain. He said that concerning the resurrection. Well, it's concerning, it's what we're talking about. The resurrected one, the finish of the finished work himself, If so be that we must add to it anything to it. If so be that it calls for my labor in any shape or form. Have we preached in vain the reality that God has set forth in his son is it not a reality at all and then I think that Paul just grows weary with the questions and with those that have asked and he says now Christ is raised up out from among the dead he affirms what we have been saying is true Hon, the salvation that God reveals in his son is true. The problem lies with those who think they have seen him and have not. The problem lies within me as one of ignorance. the finished work, the Son of God, Christ, 
is the reality. Raymond, what's on your mind? Well, um, I think the question you ask is answered in every letter, but I've, uh, you're, you're in Hebrews 10 here. And I think Hebrews is the perfect letter to look at because that's basically the point of the entire letter. Showing Christ to be the finished work, embodied, personified. Uh, even even in the verses you read, lo, I come to do thy will. I mean, even the word do is not something he did. It's in my coming. Yes, I do. Is basically my coming is the doing of the will of God. Yes, is is coming. That's true. And the word do there just means to bring the content of something. It's not just work and labor. It's basically him coming as the content of the will of God. And in his coming, bringing the content of everything ever spoken of God. That, I mean, it, this is Hebrews 1, and it starts there. Hebrews 1, sure. God has spoken in some. And the thing just goes on from that thesis statement and just proves that statement. Yes. And basically bringing Christ, declaring Christ to be the finished work. Uh, and I, I was, it's interesting that to me, this part of Hebrews 10, all of it, but this part that we're reading is a direct, indirect reference to Hebrews 9 where it starts in 924 of course and goes through because it's the once and for all is there as well but of him dying on the cross and taking away sin but it is those who look for him he shall appear the second it's the second that he established he appears as something that he's already established so it's not that he is we can go to some phrases that Paul uses in Hebrew God has not lied. And he's, or he says that in, in, in this letter. God has not lied to us. Basically, and I've said this before, that salvation is not a matter, it's not that it needs completion, it is a matter of comprehension. It is the Father revealing what is already complete. What is already not only complete in Him, but given as the gift of grace to the soul. In his presence. And it is that one, if they look for him, he appears. He appears as the content of the established, that second that is established. And I look the word established up and it's, it, it just means to, to bring something, it's to confirm something or to build something by making it stand up. So if you take that and realize that he's not talking about the second as some other things, but Christ himself, you realize that the establishing of the second is him standing up, him being raised. I mean, the second man is the Lord from heaven. That's basically what this is saying too. The second is who he is. And so I was seeing as you were talking, the whole letter to the Hebrews, he never, he never says, okay, these things are better than this thing. The whole point is, this one, who is the content of the first, is better. He's the substance of the whole thing. He's this fully come. He's this fully come. And I, as we were beginning this, the just the thoughts came to me of, of, well, a lot of it in Hebrews, and I didn't, I didn't know you were going to Hebrews 10. We didn't talk about that, but the, the verse that came to my mind, or the phrase, is, "But we see Jesus," and you're talking yeah. about knowing the finished work. That 
is not just applicable to where Paul or where Hebrew says it as far as man is concerned. That's applicable throughout the whole of this letter and applicable throughout our salvation. I mean, the questions that would come during Paul's time. What about circumcision? But we see Jesus. And in the seeing of him, you see the true circumcision of the heart that has already taken place in, in being, if he is present in your soul. What about the temple? What about the offerings? What about the priesthood? We see Jesus. I mean, to me, I mean, that's not a cop-out on the answer. That is the answer. Because the thing that hit me years ago was Paul and all the rest who saw Christ in a, as a spiritual substance, as the spiritual meaning of all of those things, still walked in the midst of those things. They walked in the midst of a temple still standing, fat sacrifices still being offered, priesthood, all of those things were still going on and looked just as valid yes. as they ever had. What had changed was these men had seen a spiritual reality. They had seen what had come. They saw the second, which was the Lord himself. So the answer to all of those things for them was, but we see Jesus. Yeah, but what about, you don't go to this, we see Jesus. What about, you don't circumcise, we see him. That's the answer to the whole thing. Yeah. And you can go on into Hebrews where he says, you are come unto Mount Zion, to all of the, and basically he's, he's again making the distinction between the first and the second by saying everything they looked for and that they saw afar off by faith, you've come to in the person of Jesus Christ. And the whole matter was not, have you come or not? No, he affirms you have come. The matter was, the issue of neglecting is right there. The issue of neglecting this great salvation is attached to you are come. Yeah. So when you ask the question, is it a reality or, or is it something that needs to be fulfilled or is it that we're ignorant of it? That answers it there. The whole point of you are come is affirmed. The question is, are you seeing him as the author and finisher of faith? And if you're not, then you are automatically neglecting the great salvation that God has given. Amen. Yes. The reality of it. something on the board and as usual I couldn't get all of it on the board uh, just the cross yeah just focus on that a minute the cross because that's the center of the whole thing not the cross as an object a historical event all of that but the cross as Christ makes it to be the cross as Christ makes it to be for he and he alone was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He makes it his. And I'm just looking, just for a picture, just the two sides of the cross, if we may call it that. On the one side, before the cross, before God unveils his perfect work. is the first the first as to the first man the old the old as to the old covenant the old temple old Israel the old the fleshly and there then there is death the whole law was an administration of death man facing death and then the soul soulish man created as a soul in the garden and we're not going to deal with all of these except just to say on that side darkness and night 
the first Adamic creation. The Jerusalem that now is or that at that time was. And the earth, the sphere of the earth and the earthiness of the earth man and of the first man as being after the earth earthy. But also on that side, farther down than we could go on the board, is the word many. Many. And many seeds. Many seeds. Many kinds. Many. On that side of the cross. Now, in all of these you can see a glimmer of a type and a shadow of something that is better something that is yet to come because God used all of this as a sign as a type as a shadow as a testimony of one yet to come even Adam started out as a testimony of one yet to come and, you, and you, you're aware of that. And, and Israel itself, and Abraham, and Isaac, and Jacob, and all of that. And Melchizedek, pointing to one yet to come. But it is all still summed up in the first order of things. The old order of things. And then, and all of that is brought into the cross it's all brought into the cross it is and, it, and, it, and it's not brought into some kind of just a natural passing away or a natural death as all men were busy dying at that time being born living and then dying being born living and then dying the cycle of a natural life now that's not what the cross brought with it. It isn't what the cross brought with it. The cross brought an end that was absolute, an end that was finished, an end that was eternal. An end of God speaking in the ways that He had spoken. An end of God viewing mankind as he had viewed them. All of that is brought right up to the cross. And that's the reason it is essential to understand the cross as being his death, his burial, not merely something that he did, who he was shown to be as Rabin was saying a while ago he is he was shown to be the will of God revealed to be the will of God there at the cross now without taking any more time on that because we could take much time across from that in the diagram that I have here, I have the first across from that, the second. The second order of things. The second man. The new. The living. The spirit. The light. The day. The new creation. Across from the many one city, one temple, one tabernacle, one priesthood, one glorious day. You could go on and say one faith, one Lord, one baptism, one body. And across from many seeds is one seed. But now I, want, I just want to do something with that diagram. And Rabin had, has verbalized it I want to just erase all of that as though 
they were simply on this side of the cross things that were improved or other things but were now of God. As has already been said here, the second is the Lord from heaven. The Son. We could put the man. The Christ. It is one. Just one. And he occupies the whole of what the scripture would relate to as the second. And none of the first is found in him. None of it. None of the first is found in him. You can still see it in the natural with your eyes and you can still hear it with your ears. You can still reason with your natural mind but you cannot find it in him. What you find in him, what you find in him, how can we say it? You find the I am that I am. You find the fullness of the Godhead bodily. What you find in him is the completeness, the fulfillment of everything promised of God, spoken of God, declared of God, and of everything given of God. In him you find complete, full salvation. Not as things. It's not like in this room, there's a bunch of chairs in this room. Not like that. Not in Him as a bunch of things, but in Him as who He is. For he is, as Rabin said a while ago, I caught the word, substance. He is the substance of our baptism, the substance of faith, the substance of God's will, the substance. The substance of his body, the substance of the church, the substance of New Jerusalem, the substance of heaven, the substance of glory, the substance of wisdom, the substance of understanding, the, un the substance of knowledge, the substance of redemption, the, re -subst the substance of resurrection, the substance of every term that is used in the scripture as a testimony of him, he is come. And he's the substance of it. When God revealed his son in Paul, Paul saw the substance of everything that he had ever believed and looked for in the law but could not find. Everything that he had ever believed and looked for in himself but could not find. We find it in Christ. 
and you're never going to find it anywhere else. Going back to what you just said, my mind goes back to the every time Paul, every, it seems like every letter he writes, he sets forth this order. He sets forth the reality that is in Christ, the reality that Christ is, and then the necessity of seeing him to know and enjoy that reality. That's, that's the order of his letter, basically. And then, you know, even even beyond that, but or, or what comes out from that knowing. Yeah. But that's the order. He always sets forth, like in Ephesians, sets forth what is uh, everything that God has summed up perfectly or comprehended in, in Christ, in Him, and then He prays that they, their eyes would be open, flooded with light, that they may know. Basically, to know what already is, to realize what's already reality. Uh, but you were saying that about the second, and I thought again that when He says He appears as the second, He also says this, without sin. Yeah. That's full salvation. Now, we look at that, and, and rightfully so, when we say without sin, we say without reference to us. Well, that's true, but it's also in reference to everything he's talking about in that entire letter. Because I think you could write over that entire age, sin. Yes. And that's, that's probably offensive to some. But you can write sin over that entire age because that missed the mark. It came short of who he is. And when yeah. he appears, he appears as everything that is not, as full salvation, as everything they merely pointed to now as the substance, the content, the meaning of it. And that's what he does in his appearing. He didn't come answering, explaining, or fixing. He comes as full salvation in its perfection, without reference to that which falls short of it. It's in the seeing of his perfection that I realize everything other than that falls short. <laughs> But God's interested in revealing the second, in revealing the fullness and the perfection that he presently is. Hallelujah. I mentioned a while ago concerning the ignorant, the ignorance that is in us. Ignorance is merely a matter of not knowing the truth. Not knowing the truth. Not knowing the truth. Ignorance. I'm not trying to insult anybody's intelligence because, well, you could be a double-barreled genius and it would do you no good when faced with the mystery of God in Christ because that's something that is revealed by the Holy Spirit and not figured out academically anyway. So, ignorance. And I was thinking of this verse which can be widely applied. Uh, Paul speaks uh, in Ephesians 4, he goes on and, and he talks about the reality, just as just just in that same order that Rabin was speaking, and he, and and here in Ephesians four, he compares it with 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 not knowing. Uh, in chapter four, well, verse first and fifteen, he says, "Speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ." And then in verse 17, 
He says, This I say, brethren, testifying the Lord, that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Now, that's not the only place he talks about this. Very briefly, 2 Corinthians Again, right into the church. Second Corinthians, the fourth chapter. Coming out of that chapter, chapter 3, where he's dealing so much with the veil that is upon the heart. And the veil can be a very religious thing. The veil was first upon the face of Moses. Moses, my God, was taken up into the mount of God for that time, for that place, at that time, the mount of God, Sinai. No, 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 later there comes the reality, the mount of God is Zion, and that mount fulfilled in Christ because Hebrews says, Ye are come to Mount Zion. Well, look around. I'm sure you won't see anything in the natural that even remotely looks like Mount Zion. You're looking at me, and I'm looking at you, and we're looking at each other, and that don't look like Zion to me. But then what would Zion look like to the natural mind since Zion, as used in the Scripture, has never been a natural place anyway, but a condition spoken of God that he related to a place, yes, and to a people. But we have come to that as a place, as a location? No. We have come to that reality in the person of Christ. We have come to that reality through the indwelling Christ himself. You have come to Mount Zion. Now come on, sweetheart. Paul is talking about that here. He's talking about that. In Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. But the veil is still upon their face. The veil that was upon the face of Moses, later transferred to the tabernacle of Moses, there hang the same veil in principle, the same veil. And what it did, it veiled the glory. It veiled the glory. And Paul is saying here, it still veils the glory. And there's only one, and, 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 but he says it veils the glory, and yet, and yet, the veil is done away in Christ. You will not find the veil in Christ. The same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament which is done away in Christ. And the word veil there at the last has, has been added. But even to this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their hearts. And honey, it's the Scripture. The Scripture that was of his day. The Scripture. And the only answer is when that same heart, nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil which is not found in Christ shall be taken away. Now, the Lord is that Spirit and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. 
we all with open face, an unveiled heart, beholding as in the glass. See, here's the answer. Beholding the thing which the veil prevented. But now, turning to Him, the Lord Himself, who is that Spirit, the veil is done away from our heart. And we behold the glory of the Lord, the thing that could not be seen as face to face in the mountain and the thing that could not be approached in the tabernacle because of the veil, but all of that has come to its end. And now in Christ Jesus. Now you are come to Mount Zion. Now the Lord is that spirit. The heart that turns to see Him. Transformed. Even as by the Lord Himself. The Lord who is that Spirit. But he goes on in chapter 4. How I'd love to go through this verse by verse. We've renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. Not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully. If our gospel is hid, it's hid to them that are lost. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ. It's the same light he's always been talking about here, honey, and he's going to specifically say that in just a moment. Who is the image of God should shine into them. For we preach not ourselves, it's not about it, we're not, no, no. But Christ Jesus is this Lord. He's the Lord of glory. He's the glory of God. Ourselves, your servants, for His sake, for God. And then He brings it all together right here. What couldn't be done in the old tabernacle. What couldn't be done upon the old mountain. But ye are come to Christ. You are now in Him. He is in you. God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts. To give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Hon, we were separated from the glory by the veil that is made up of so many things. It's a religious veil. It's a veil of the natural. It's a veil Embodying, embodying all that is first, all that is old, all that is not Christ himself. The natural mind. But the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Liberty. I'm glad Rabin used this term again and again because it is the term that is certainly upon our hearts but we see Jesus and we would so have you to see him with us we would have you to fellowship with us in the seeing of him 
in so much that our fellowship is with the Father and the Son. Yes, the Father revealing the Son. That our fellowship may abound. I'm not talking about an organization that our fellowship may abound throughout the body of Jesus Christ. Raven, I'm finished. Well, I think our time's up, but I just wanted to say it ended to some degree. Go right ahead. I was thinking of a quote that. Uh, I read, I think, uh, Andrew Murray made it. And he said that the problem with all of us is not our salvation, but the fact that we are ignorant of its nature. Yeah, isn't that something? Ignorance of the nature of our salvation is the problem. Well, that, that is true. And he goes on to say, and that is that it is spiritual in all thoroughly, fully spiritual. And I think that is the problem. It's, you know, we can look here and look there and try to find it, but the real problem is that we still see things through the veil. And it's also called the veil of flesh basically which was the body that Jesus put to death <laughs> his, his flesh the veil which is his flesh and I think it is it is just that it is attempting to he goes on and says that we think humanly upon spiritual things trying to define spiritual matters looking at flesh and that's the problem it's not salvation is not complete salvation is not perfect is that our understanding is not perfect. And the only way our understanding becomes perfect is when he is the perfect understanding being revealed in us. <laughs> there is basically the perfect understanding of God being revealed in us. So, I just thought that was a fitting quote for the what we were saying. That it's not a matter of salvation, but our ignorance of the nature of it. Amen. Well, I know that to the natural mind we speak foolishness. I've spoken foolishness to the natural mind for some time. But to the heart that would know him, we speak life. Do consider what we're talking about. Consider it in the light of the scripture, but more than that, consider it according to the true hunger of your heart. Salvation is come and it's come in the person of the indwelling Christ. My heart longs to know him and rejoices in the knowing of him. And may, may that be the work of the Spirit of God in your heart and soul as well. May the Lord richly bless you. Thank you for being with us. Let us hear from you. If there's any way we can help you, let us know. Amen. Have a good night.